Today I'm going to tear down, clean, and reassemble this Victor two-spring motor. This is a single barrel two-spring design that Victor started using in 1918. They continued using it all the way through the orthophonic era in the late 1920s. This particular motor came from a VVXI, which is a Model 11. Also in 1918, Victor started stamping their identification tags with the letter A. This indicates that it had this new style of motor inside. They dropped the letter A designation in around 1920. So pretty much every Victrola two-spring that was built after 1918 had this style of motor inside. This was a very good design for Victor. It was very efficient and it was a very reliable motor. And this motor, being close to 100 years old, is still operational. The objective to tearing these down and cleaning them is to remove the old lubricants. After 100 years, the oils and the lubricants have turned sticky and hard, especially inside of the spring barrels where Victor used a Vaseline and graphite mixture. And again, after 100 years, it's turned sticky. The springs need to be able to glide against one another as it winds down. And with the stickiness, the springs get stuck the motor keeps running and eventually the grease gives way to the spring, the power of the spring, so it lets go all at once. And that is the thumping that you hear inside of your Victrola as it winds down. So also, with the introduction of this style motor, Victor started stamping numbers on the outside of their spring barrels. This one is stamped with 17. That indicates that there are two 17-foot springs inside of the spring barrel. Now we'll have a quick look at how the motor operates and we'll look at it again after we get the, the motor all in pieces. As you can see, the crank threads into a small winding gear, which is located right here. That winding gear corresponds with a larger winding gear, which is right here. So as I turn the crank, I'm turning the larger winding gear. It has a small catch and you can barely see down inside of here that toggles back and forth. It's, it's catching on these little teeth that go around so that the crank will only go in one, one direction. So we'll give this one a, a little winding and get it started running. This gear on the side has a half shaft, which goes halfway into the spring barrel. It inserts only into this first spring. As I said, of course, there are two springs inside of here. From the center of this shaft to the outer edge of the spring, the outer edge of the spring attaches to the spring barrel right here on the other side of this rivet. This first one winds in counterclockwise, so if it's going this way, the second spring is attached and it goes the opposite direction. So this is how we're get, obtaining 34 feet of spring. The drive gear on the other side still has a half shaft, just like this one. It's, it goes only into the center of that second spring. So all the power now is to this drive gear. The drive gear is attached to the spindle, which is right here by means of a worm drive. The spindle, of course, goes all the way to the top where your platter sits. So, by winding this crank, I'm storing energy inside of these springs. The energy from that's going to this drive gear, which goes to the spindle, which goes to your platter on top. Without some means of regulating that power, it would spin out of control, and this is where they've inserted a governor to intercept some of that power. There's a small gear that's attached to the spindle. It is a worm drive gear as well that powers this governor. The governor regulates the speed by means of a friction disc, and of course the governor expands and contracts due to centrifugal force of these weights while it's spinning. There's a friction pad which is attached to the lever that goes to your speed control on top. And of course you know what the speed control on the top looks like. It screws in and out. By screwing this in and out it's moving that lever back and forth. Which is right here. 
So it's putting pressure on this pad by means of a friction pad, only allowing this governor to, governor to expand and contract to a certain point, wherever that, that friction pad is set at by, by means of your regulator on top. So that's a real quick overview of how this thing works. We'll look at it again when we get it all in pieces and we'll understand a little bit more about it as we go along. Now we're going to completely let this motor run down and I'll go ahead and remove the crank and uh, we'll let the springs lose all of their tension before we get started on the disassembly process. You want to make sure that the motor is completely wound down before you remove the spring barrel because if you don't and there's still power in there, that'll send this drive gear spinning and chances are it'll spin up against these gears on the spindle and you can definitely damage these gears that doing that. I have questions all the time that my Victrola plays at a good speed and then it slows down and then it speeds back up. Well, chances are that someone's damaged these gears in some way, and as you can see, if you follow this pointer around, if these were damaged right here at this point on this drive gear, it takes a little while for it to get back around to the spindle. So every time that damaged part passes the spindle, it slows the motor down a little bit, and then after it passes, it comes back up to speed again. So chances are someone's tried to remove the spring barrel without taking all the tension out of the springs and or somehow this drive gear has gotten bent and that can be done simply by taking the motor out and setting it on a hard surface. Also happens during shipping if you buy a motor from eBay and someone uh, puts it in the box and doesn't put enough padding around it during shipping it will bend this drive gear and uh, it definitely uh, hampers the performance of the motor. Now you can see that it is wound down on its own, but it is not completely wound down, and I'm going to test to make sure that the motor is wound down simply by pulling on the spindle on the top. And we'll zoom in on this and let you see what I'm doing here. If you lift up on the spindle, it should remain in one position or the other. This one's spinning, it's falling back down into place, so I'm going to superficially wind this motor down. and you can actually see from the inside maybe a little bit better. We want this to remain in either position whenever I pull on that spindle, so I'm going to go ahead and let it run a little bit longer. Now it's remaining in one spot or the other, so all the power has been taken out of this motor now. I'm ready to remove the motor from the motor board. I first need to access this side of the motor board to remove the needle that is under this little door right here. So to do that, so far I've had this sitting on a box that's about two inches tall. I have a hole poked in the middle of it that gave me a nice level work area right on this side of the motor board. I need to be able to flip it over, so I've got a taller box. This is simply a box that's been cut down. Get that one out of the way and bring this box in. This box has just been cut down to be about uh, 8 inches tall or so. And this gives me the opportunity that I can flip this board over and it keeps, the, keeps from resting on this drive gear. So, this in place, I can now remove, slide this little cover over and remove this needle indicator. <clears throat> the needle indicator is held into position by a very small nut that you can see right here. 
I'm just going to take needle nose pliers and remove that nut. And I have parts cups that I keep handy. I'll have several parts cups that I'll use during this process. But that keeps all your parts in place. There should be a washer on here, but I'm just going to grab this. Let's see if the washer will come off now. I'm just going to grab this with my needle nose pliers and wiggle it back and forth and lift up. Well, there's the washer. I'll put that in the parts cup along with that nut. And now this needle indicator should just pull it off of here. Sometimes you have to wiggle it back and forth, but there we go. I'll put that in the cup as well. And I'm ready to flip the motor back over. So I'll bring my other box in. On the two spring motor there are three bolts that hold the motor to the motor board and there are six nuts. The top nut being a lock nut, that one's already loose. Uh, you can use a number 11 metric wrench or a 7 16 wrench. And I'm just going to loosen that top nut off of here. cup to keep all these bolts in. There should be three felt washers that go in between the motor and the motor board. should pull straight up and off and we have the motor loosened up now. <clears throat> here are my three bolts and on top of the motor board here are the three felt washers. I'll put them in the cup as well. Those are there strictly for vibration purposes. Next thing I'll do is I'll go ahead and remove the spring barrel. I'm going to do this with a small screwdriver. The screw for that is located on the side of the drive gear, which is right here. And here's the screw. It should just come right out of there. That screws into a shaft that goes through the center of the spring barrel. I'm going to go ahead and completely remove that out. There it is. I'll put it into a parts cup. With the screw removed, the shaft should be loose. And simply by pushing on the side, you can see it's pushing out the other the other end over here. I'll hold this up just slightly just to pull that out, and the spring barrel comes out. I'll set this aside for now. There's a little picture of the winding catch. The winding catch simply pulls off of the side over here. And uh, always remember that the hook part of the winding catch goes towards these gears because it does go on either, either way. 